Hello everyone, my name is Joe Wojcikowski. Thank you for tuning in today to my presentation for my final project. Today I'll be presenting on how the works and theories of James Mooney compare to life in athletics. I will give a macro view on the entire field of athletics and an experiential micro view on the St. Francis University men's volleyball team as a comparison to Mooney's ideas presented in his book, Onward Industry. As we know, management principles are needed in many organizations outside of the business realm. After all, Mooney was famous for saying the quote, Organization is the form of every human association. By the end of this presentation, you will better understand Mooney's theories, life in athletics, and how they correlate. First, I would like to start with some background information for you all so that you better understand what I'm getting into. I was interested in comparing the business management principles from this course to the St. Francis University men's volleyball team because of my experience with the team. In May, I just finished my last of five years from 2013 to 2018 as a player on the team and to become part of my life. I am happy that I'll be returning to the team this spring as part of the staff to continue to help out. The team consists of 21 players aged 18 to 23 one assistant coach, and one head coach. There are also some ancillary staff members of which I'll be a part of. My role will be to help the coaching staff with their duties of personnel decisions and scouting opponents. I will also help in improving players and tracking their performance. I wanted to better understand how the information I am learning here in this class can help me better understand the way the team works and benefit me in the future. Let's transition now to the man behind this whole presentation. James D. Mooney was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1884. He attended Case School of Applied Sciences in Mining and Metallurgy, now known as Case Western Reserve. He majored in Mining Engineering. There's conflicting information in our text and online sources whether or not he actually graduated, but that is somewhat irrelevant. He left for gold mining expeditions in Mexico and California. Between 1910 and 1917, he bounced around quite a bit, holding jobs at Westinghouse, B.F. Goodrich, and Hyatt Roller Bearing Company, during which time he became increasingly involved in corporate management. At the end of 1917, although he was 33, he enlisted and served as a captain in the U.S. Army in France with the 309th Ammunition Regiment, 159th Field Art Artillery. After the war, Mooney returned to Hyatt, which had been recently acquired by General Motors. He was later appointed to the head of GM's export division. He contemplated a system that worked specifically for this fraction of the company as the multi-divisional setup that GM had established from DuPont Company did not seem to fit his model. This is because many of the regions and laws he was dealing with in exports. He was intrigued by the success of his idea to set up his export division by geographical location, so started thinking of the history of management. He joined with one Alan C. Riley, a historian from Columbia, to trace the history of organized activities. Their collaborative work resulted in the text Onward Industry. Both Mooney and Riley are authors on the book, but it came out later that Mooney had provided most of the conceptual information while Riley just supplied the historical information. A few different things came out of Mooney's review of history and his experience that made it into the book. I want to touch on some of the main points. The first point he made is that organization is as old as time. He said that, quote, organization is the form of every human association for the attainment of a common purpose. He goes on to say that an organization is like the human experience. Quote, Our bodies are simply the means and the instrument through which the psychic force moves toward the attainment of its aims and desires. Another important observation was that industries all aimed for profit through service. That alleviated human want and misery. The last and possibly most important was the conceptual model of organization that Mooney developed. It is comprised of three parts. One, the coordinated principle, two, the scalar principle, and three, the functional principle. 
I will touch on each of these parts here individually going forward in the presentation. My biggest takeaway personally from Mooney's teachings was his quote that organization is the form of every human association. This means that the principles he covers can be applied to any aspect of life. Again, I have chosen to compare them to the field of athletics. The first of the principles I would like to start with is the coordinative principle. It is, quote, the orderly arrangement of group effort to provide unity of action in the pursuit of a common purpose. That is almost the definition of a sports team, if you think about it. One main point in the coordinated principle is that there is one supreme coordinating power. On a collegiate athletic team, this can be viewed as the head coach. They are the prime decision makers for the entity. They are the ones who decide when and who gets to play. There is obviously a lot of responsibility on the coach and any supreme coordinating power for that matter. Of course, the great saying that with great power comes great responsibility definitely holds true in this case. Many people are obviously very familiar with the head coaches of sports teams. They're often the face of the team in collegiate athletics as the mainstay of the program. They often get a ton of credit when the teams do well and get a lot of heat then when the teams do poorly. In fact, you look at the college coaches of the richest programs in the richest sport, football, in America, and this is what they make. Just look at these unbelievable numbers thanks to Business Insider. You have the highest paid coach, Nick Saban, making $11.1 .1 million. You can come down and see some of these other coaches, like Urban Meyer at Ohio State, making 6.4 as the fourth highest paid coach. These coaches are paid so well because of their proven ability to be the supreme coordinating power of the hundreds of people it takes to be an elite football program in the NCAA. Like I said earlier, though, there are ramifications for those who do not handle this perceived responsibility well. For many fans, this is well known. Look at the recent story of Urban Meyer, the previously mentioned head coach of Ohio State football. His personal reputation and relationships were deeply attacked and affected by his recent actions. We do not have to get into those right now. Whatever side of the situation you sit on, it's easy to see how him being the head decision maker puts him at risk for this type of scrutiny. The NCAA goes as far to outline the rules that an institution must follow or be sanctioned for it. There have been numerous cases that question the, quote, institutional control of a program. As outlined by the NCAA, the head coaches are one of the big figureheads in charge of making sure their program is run by the books. Some think this should be carried by the higher-ups in the sports world, but this is just not the reality in college football. The coaches' heads are on the line when talking about the responsibility of following all rules, top to bottom, as a program. Some professional programs, although rare, just have a head coach as a placeholder. Their supreme coordinating power is someone else, like an owner. The Dallas Cowboys of the National Football League are a great example of this. They have all of their decisions come from their owner, Jerry Jones. He is a well-known billionaire who takes care of the decisions for his franchise. This is different than college football programs whose decision making usually stops at the head coach. Now look at these two cartoons, each published in newspapers across the country. Right or wrong, they are personally attacking these supreme decision making powers for their alleged transgressions with domestic violence on their watch, so to speak. One case, the head coach is to blame by the media. The other case, the team owner to blame from the media. Again, with this great supreme power becomes a lot of responsibility and thus scrutiny in the sports world and beyond. Another big point outlined in the coordinative principle is the doctrine to focus the efforts of the group. This is also not foreign to athletics. The volleyball team also has its own doctrine that is handed out each year. This doctrine is defined by the text as something that was made for an organization to, quote, understand its purpose and the procedure necessary to attain it. It details the plans for the team and the direction the team wants to follow to succeed. It is normally a packet that is a few pages long handed out by the head coach at the beginning of each year. The coach makes it a faux contract that binds each player to the rules set out in the packet but at least everyone on the team knows the goals to attain for that season and the criteria on which they will be judged. 
Surplus through service is also a big point of this principle. This talks about the purpose of industry effort being the alleviation of human want and misery. This is a little difficult to compare to sport. The best I can think of is that these athletes want to continue playing and enjoy doing it. For many, college athletics alleviates the problem and stress of paying full price for a college degree. It could be seen that the service is the athletes and coaches perform is putting time and effort into their sport. Athletes practice and train while coaches prepare players and scout for their opponents. The break-even point is remaining the same as far as skill and knowledge. The surplus would be gaining more skill and knowledge to be able to use in their sport. Another aspect of the coordinated principle here would be the democracy of letting their people pick their leaders. The players get to choose who they want to play for on signing day but beyond that have no power over the school's decision on who they want as a head coach. Therefore, the coach lets the players pick their own captains to serve as an intermediate at times between the coach and players. In a phone interview with St. Francis University men's volleyball head coach, Mike Rumbaugh, who's entering his 21st season with the team, he revealed his thoughts that, quote, My best teams had the best leadership. I've seen my most talented teams crumble because the seniors were not the best leaders, even though they thought they were. When the right guys in the locker room step up to lead and the team wants them as their leaders, that's when I've seen success. In another interview with the team's most recent captain, Stephen Broswell, he was able to shed light on his perspective, saying, quote, I think the guys liked having a captain they could vote on. We all believed in Coach Rumbaugh, but just to give the players a voice was nice. It was an easy line of communication from me to him, so the coach got the message to us, and we could send our messages back to him. It's easy to see how this coordinated principle is used here in athletics. The lines of communication he talked about make a nice segue into the next topic. The scalar principle is very evident on the team. Our text defines it as the formal process through which the supreme coordinating authority operates from the top throughout the entire organized body. In athletics, the head coach passes down his system throughout the organization. This means that he instructs the other staff members, assistants, managers, strength coaches, support staff, on how he wants the job done. You can imagine how this may be easy for someone like Coach Rumbaugh, who only has a handful of staff. But you have people like Nick Saban, pictured here, who I mentioned before as the Alabama head football coach, who has 14 direct assistants, according to the team website. This team would need to practice the scalar principle a lot more regularly with more efficiency. In the case of Coach Rumbaugh, he delegates some of his duties out to the assistants and support staff and suggests to other personnel how they could optimize player performance. It seems that how a supreme coordinating power is able to reach their subsidiaries will have a big role on their success. Functional differentiation is a key part to the success of any team. Functional differentiation is said to be, quote, Distinction Between Different Kinds of Duties by Mooney In athletics, especially volleyball, this is done through positioning. Every player is given a position to excel in. The coaches identify the strengths of each player and have them stay in that position. This way, each player can grow up and excel at one position to help the team succeed. Each coach also has an area of expertise that they can help with. An article on the American Volleyball Coaches Association website by Billy Ebel, the associate head coach of Lipscomb Volleyball, talks about how important it is to train players by their position instead of as a whole team. Some coaches are specific position coaches while others focus on strength training or conditioning. There is a need for coordination between all the members of the staff to make sure they are making one cohesive unit. Again, making the scalar principle essential for functional differentiation to work best. James Mooney's organizational theories are very applicable to the world of athletics as you've seen. It would be interesting to see if there could be a study done to quantify how well teams do compared to their hypothetical performance metrics in each of the principles I outlined. It would also be interesting to compare the results and opinions of teams who use different supreme powers, head coaches, owners, general managers, etc. I hope that this project has given me the ability to see how the team now operates. I can now help apply these theories so that the organization runs smoothly. After all, Mooney did say that he felt the application of principles of organization could solve the problems of modern civilization. Thank you for watching and have a good day.